National Retail Federation and Agricultural Transportation Agriculture Transportation Coalition. Um, we're going to give people a couple more seconds to get in. Uh, you know, as with all the HTA events, this is for educational purposes only, so you can't repurpose this or reproduce this in any way. But if you need to get a hold of anyone from the HTA or any of our presenters, go ahead and shoot me an email, eric at harvardtrucker.com, and I can pass your information along. Give uh, audience a couple more minutes, uh, about a minute, half a minute left until we get started. Um, I know we're all kind of used to these by now, so if you need help, if you don't have audio or if you don't have video, go ahead and contact me either via your chat function or you know, like email me, eric at harvardtrucker.com. And throughout the presentation, you can email your questions at any time. We'll be able to see them. We'll have a brief, we'll have a conversation and then followed by a moderated Q&A. So go ahead and submit questions anytime you feel like it. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Peter. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, everybody, for jumping on. Um, first and foremost, uh, we are very lucky to have both uh, Peter and John on this. It is uh, without saying that they are huge advocates of our industry and uh, the supply chain. And um, we're very lucky to get both of them on. So we want to take full advantage. So Real quick, I'm just going to do quick introductions. Most of you guys know who these guys are, but uh, John Gold uh, has a degree from American University of International Business. He worked uh, nine years for RELA, various capacities. Uh, final job was the VP of Global, Global Supply Chain. Uh, worked briefly at uh, US Customs and Border Patrol. And then he's been in the NRF uh, as the VP Supply Chain and Customs policy VP for the last 13 years, responsible basically for being the voice at Congress for um, the NRF. Mr. Friedman has a law degree from the University of Washington. I believe he practices law in two or three different states. And uh, he's the counsel, he was counsel for US Senate Committee of Commerce, Science and Transportation, and in 84 helped draft the Shipping Act, probably did most of the work knowing him. Um, he also did a lot of other functions during that time, including uh, a lot of international and domestic transportation legislation, harbor maintenance trust fund, alternative energy tax initiatives, and other stuff. Along with leading the AgTC as the executive director for the last 32 years, he has served as counsel to organizations such as Pacific Coast Council of Custom Brokers and Freight Forwarders. That's a long one. That's not an acronym one. Uh, coalition of New England Companies for Trade, and various, various other things. So, obviously, you guys are well-versed. Um, I'm going to basically ask a question, and then each one of you are going to answer, and we'll just kind of keep on one topic. You guys get to uh, go back and forth, and um, we're going to keep it pretty open, so that if you say something, it's nothing real formal here. We've got about eight to ten questions like Peter's already left, so he's done. Um, so I'm gonna get going and we'll start on the import side and start with Mr. John. The biggest hurdles today for importers uh, within the supply chain, can you kind of go over maybe pre-COVID, now with COVID, and then maybe what the future holds after COVID, uh, if you have a crystal ball, what it looks like? <laughs> Good uh, luck only with that. That's like it, two or it, three it, questions at once. Yeah, if only I, if only I had that crystal ball. I mean, obviously, you know, pre-COVID when we came into uh, 2020, we were looking at 2020 as being, you know, a really good year. We came up with a very strong 2019. Imports continued to grow. We were expecting growth uh, throughout 2020. Retail had one of its best holiday seasons, you know, ever uh, coming into 2020. Uh, and then all that suddenly changed. Uh, you know, the initial impact of, uh, you know, coronavirus and COVID was just, you know, within China and the Chinese supply chain and what was happening with uh, factories being closed down, ability to get goods. Uh, as that continued, started to spread throughout the rest of the world, obviously that complicated, you know, other supply chains. While a lot of folks were focusing on, you know, when are my Chinese factories going to be back up and running after the Lunar New Year, when can I get products in again? Then you started seeing other uh, other issues starting to happen, and now with the you know spread throughout the U.S. and you know everybody being basically shut down for for six weeks, that certainly had a significant impact on on everybody. 
Um, you've got a lot of retailers that were deemed uh, you know, non-essential, which means their operations are basically shut down. They weren't able to, to sell their products. Uh, those that were deemed essential, you know, kept their stores open and, and you know, were able to, to sell through, but it was more on the essential needs and it wasn't on discretionary income, discretionary products that folks were looking for. So even though, you know, stores were shut down, e-commerce has grown pretty significantly. Uh, I think I heard, you know, in one of their presentations that uh, I was doing, folks have said that, uh, you know, we've seen three years of innovation in three months, basically. Uh, within the supply chain and, and within the e-commerce space. So that certainly has been a, a growth area, but that doesn't make up for stores being closed down. Uh, even before you know, COVID, online sales were you know, less than 20% of overall retail sales. Uh, that certainly has grown uh, pretty significantly, but again, doesn't make up for the inability to go and shop in store and that in-store experience that, that folks were uh, are so used to. And that e-commerce you know, we've seen has certainly strained the system as well. Uh, presents its own challenges. Uh, was it last week or the week before, uh, you know, FedEx said they had to limit the number of shipments from certain retailers. They typically do that around the holidays because the volumes are so large. But you know, this has been continuous now for you know going on two and a half months. So it's it's caused other issues. So uh, right now, obviously, the focus is getting stores back up and running, and how do you turn that inventory for stores that were closed, uh, and then how do you project in the future? Uh, and where's the where's the consumer going to be as well? I think a lot of this is going to depend on consumer confidence. Um, we are seeing some signs that consumer confidence is coming back and is is growing. Uh, we saw some of that last week, and hopefully that will will continue. Uh, but obviously, you know, we've also seen the stories that a lot of retailers have uh, canceled orders uh, going forwards too, because they just don't know where they're going to be. Uh, you've seen you know a couple of you know high profile retailers have said they're just not going to be opening up their their stores again. Uh, and a lot of small retailers are still in that position as well, trying to figure out what their future is going to be. So I think uh, it certainly has been a challenge. Uh, a lot of learnings that have happened over the past few weeks that hopefully folks will continue to, to push forwards on. And there's going to be a lot of you know changes, I think, when you go into a store and, uh, and do your shopping. And certainly we encourage folks, you know, get back out and do your shopping. Uh, you know, we know uh, while well, you might not want to go in the store, you know, buy online, pick up curbside. A lot of folks have done, you know, curbside pickups. It's been great, the, the contactless uh, pickups. So uh, there's a lot there, and I think folks are in the process now of just, just trying to figure it out. Uh, I think things have, have certainly changed. And certainly there's, you know, a ripple throughout the supply chain because it all starts with the retailer and goes back to, you know, how does this impact the, the trucker? How does this impact the warehouse? What are the new requirements that are going to be for, for those working in the warehouse or those visiting the warehouse. So all of that is, is going to be uh, yet to be determined, uh, you know, working through it and trying to figure out what guidance we're still waiting on uh, coming from CDC or others that can kind of help enhance and provide more clarity on what folks are supposed to do. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that, that we've certainly faced um, has been kind of the patchwork uh, we've seen throughout the states on different requirements for shutting down and now for opening again. Uh, that certainly has been a challenge, especially for you know retailers that operate on a national basis. Uh, we need to see clarity and uniformity throughout. So um, let me stop there and kind of you know there's a lot more we can we can discuss on those issues. Um, specifically to supply chain and what we all do, uh, we bring the loads out of the terminal and bring them to your facilities. What are the biggest pain points you feel are right now, minus COVID? What are the biggest pain points that your membership is faced with? Um, a couple of years ago in talking with uh, Laura Crow, it was visibility, um, you know, those kinds of things. What, what are the big hot topics today with your membership? I think visibility has always been an issue. And it's, I mean, I'm still surprised that in 2020, we don't have better visibility tools that, you know, folks can use. Um, that would help everybody, to be honest. Uh, you know, we know that, you know, as we talked about congestion issues, you know, years ago that still continue, the ability to have that visibility and better planning uh, is certainly something that, that everybody needs. It's, you know, from, from start to finish, uh, you know, folks have the information. Why are we not doing a better job of sharing and forecasting and planning uh, throughout? I think that could certainly help alleviate uh, a lot of the issues that we had previously. And, you know, now is the time to be doing that. Uh, you know, we know there's going to be an eventual ramp up again of, you know, cargo coming in and going out. We need to spend time figuring out how do we get this right and why aren't we working together 
collectively to make sure that we don't get into a situation that we did years ago, uh, you know, when the, you know, cargo started flowing heavily again. Uh, you know, we don't want to get into a congestion situation that we know we've, we've experienced. So yeah. we need to be planning now. We need to make sure that the carriers, terminal operators, truckers, labor, BCOs are all working together, say, here's what we anticipate is going to happen. Here's are the pain points. Here are the issues. How do we address those issues now so that we don't get stuck into in a place in a couple of months where, hey, we're looking back, we told you this was going to happen. Why weren't we ready and why weren't we prepared? Right. Mr. Peter. All right, same question. Biggest hurdles and challenges right now for your exporters within the supply chain, COVID and non-COVID related. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, uh, it's good to be doing this with the Harbor Trucking Association because it was uh, a number of years ago that one of the major California exporters uh, said, wait a second, a member of the Agriculture Transportation Coalition on the advisory board at one of our meetings said, wait a sec, I want the truckers in the AgTC because the truckers are the only ones who actually knows what's going on with the supply chain all the way through from the beginning to the end. The terminals, they're the only ones who will tell us what's actually happening at the terminals and the effort to get in and out of the terminals. So since then, We've had a lot of truckers as members and as leaders of the AgTC because for many of the exporters, it's the trucker who actually knows what needs to be done for the supply chain. So people like you, Peter and, and Robert, you two were on our virtual meeting last, last week. Uh, we had uh, 476 people attending for two days, three hours each day. You two were speaking, uh, Knight, Road One, Divine, <coughs> Quite a few others of the Harbor Trucking Association's members are members of the AgTC, and that's been, uh, I think, mutually beneficial uh, for the truckers, for the exporters, for sure. Okay, so what are our challenges? Uh, exporters have been whipsawed for the last six months. Uh, at first, uh, we got into the tariffs against uh, China, uh, and China retaliated and particularly focused on things that were vulnerable, soybeans, pork, other things. And things were looking pretty miserable uh, for some of the ag exporters trying to get the product into China. So they had to redouble their efforts to get open new markets, the growing emerging markets, Vietnam, Indonesia, even India and so forth. But, you know, things turn and in this business, not everything's predictable. The African swine flu came in, decimated the pork herds of Asia uh, and China, and all of a sudden China needed, despite all the tariffs on our pork, they needed all the pork they could get from the United States. Well, Brazil has sort of stepped up with pork and chicken, but now with COVID, Brazil is going to have to back off their ability to export. They're creating even more demand for the U.S. exporter to get their product. And here we have trucking. The Harbor Trucking Associ uh, Association is really looking at drayage, a lot of drayage at the West Coast ports. But frankly, the best way to get our protein from our members in Wisconsin and Nebraska and Kansas and Colorado and so forth to the ports on the West Coast is by truck. A lot of rail movement is true. But if you're in a hurry, you put it on a truck and the truck goes with double teams and so forth. And so you've got a lot of truckers moving cargo right into the ports uh, from the middle of the country. Uh, we have had some real challenges because when John's members are not able to get the retail imports from China because China due to COVID shut down for a while, those factories were not producing if they weren't producing, the ships were not leaving China. They're not going to bring an empty ship from China just to care, come here to carry our exports. Meanwhile, the demand for our exports remained very high. So we have this challenge. Our exporters need the importers to be healthy. We need the importers to have volumes coming in because we need those containers whether it's imported shrimp or what have you, so it's the reefer containers, 
we need those containers and particularly need the containers in the middle of the country. So during all this period for the last few months, where it has impacted the importers, it has impacted the exporters almost inversely. The import cargo is not coming in because the factories were shut. And so we were short here. Our exporters had a lot of demand still outbound, but didn't have the containers we needed. Well, then COVID hits here and our demand for that China factory production and for the retailer's goods uh, diminished. And therefore, again, the containers weren't coming in and we didn't have the containers for our exports going out. So there's a symbiotic relationship, but it almost hits at opposite periods of time. Uh, we have plenty of challenges and plenty of opportunities though to improve things. Look, at, we have the lightest truck weights in the developed world, in California in particular. It's 80,000 gross weight. In Canada, it's 105.5. In Oregon and Washington, 105,500. But there's no country in the world, developed country, that has 80,000 pounds. And that restricts the amount of cargo that can be carried efficiently to the ports and from the ports and to de retail destinations. Now, retailers, your, your challenge is particularly the length. So you can get more of the lighter weight cargo into one truck voyage. Ours is heavy. Our cargo is all heavy. There are some heavyweight, short heavyweight corridors at West Coast ports, like in Oakland and so forth. But I'm talking about going across the state. The onion producers and potato and so forth in Utah, they need to be able to drive straight across to the har uh, harbors to the ports on, in California. Uh, folks in Wyoming, Montana and so forth, they need to be able to come all the way across to the ports at the West Coast. So while we're working with you all and the truckers to try to get these heavyweight corridors expanded in California, these are too short. We need to join with the rest of the world. Our problem for our exporter is a hay exporter uh, out of, uh, well, from Central, from the Imperial Valley. Right. They drive from there to the port in LA and Long Beach. The problem is they have to send three trucks while the Canadian competitor only sends two trucks and trucking is expensive. There's congestion at the ports, there's delay, all the rest, which you know. So this is a detrimental feature which impacts our competitiveness because anything you're exporting in agriculture and forest products could benefit from a heavier weight limit. And that's one of the things that we need to work on. Now, recently, uh, this Congress has reacted by increasing truck weights in certain circumstances for certain cargoes around the country. Heck, we've got 129,000 for <clears throat> some agricultural products going out of some of the agriculture states, pro-business states, I would have to say. But it's also a challenge for the West Coast, and we can talk about that later if you want. But the other ports in other pro-business states in Georgia, South Carolina, and so forth, they're increasing their truck weights as well. Hours of service, we can talk about that if you wish, but this Congress has provided a great deal more flexibility in hours of service, which are very important, again, for the exports for where they come. But our primary challenge right now is getting the containers, getting the 20 footers that we need, getting the reefer containers, not only at the ports, but inland. Central Valley, and then all the way into the Midwest. And that's that's our challenge now. Uh, and so while we're very enthusiastic about retailers able to get back in business, whether it's e-commerce or others, and get those co containers coming back into this country in the volumes that our exporters need, because the world is still demanding our exports. Right. Thank you. Um, John. Uh, kind of on the same uh, topic, what do you, and bo for both of you, what do you think we can do to help motor carriers with what's going on right now and what you guys both just explained? What can we do to help as the HTA, the CTA, um, motor carriers in general across the country? 
I mean, I think, you know, as, as Peter noted, I mean, you guys, as HTA, as the truckers, you guys are kind of on the front lines uh, with all this. So you guys kind of know your eyes and ears on the ground and kind of see all the issues and, uh, you know, can, can, can react. I think, you know, making sure you are working closely with your BCOs uh, to let them know what the issues are and, you know, work with them on trying to develop some solutions as well. And I think, uh, you know, being the bridge between the BCO and the terminal, uh, the BCO and the port, uh, I think is, is incredibly important. I think, you know, as I noted, you know, we all need to be in the room together talking about what the issues are and what the solutions are. So I think making sure you guys are working closely with your BCO partners to make sure they understand what's going on uh, and, you know, what you guys have as potential solutions as well. And if there are things that you need the BCOs to help with and continue to push, I think that is certainly one of the, the you know, key things that you guys need to be be working on. I mean, I know obviously with all the issues, LA Long Beach, you know, you guys have been great working through that. And I think continuing to push and be creative, uh, be flexible uh, and be, you know, nimble and agile, I think are all things that uh, I know BCOs are looking for right now, but that that partnership is is critical uh, and be forward thinking uh, is another part of that as well. Mr. Peter. Okay, thank you, Mr. Peter. Uh, 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 look at it. There, there are a few things that we uh, can continue to work on together and need to fix. Uh, your members at the, in the Harbor Trucking Association are all really focused on the West Coast ports and terminals. And it is in the interest of all the truckers who serve those West Coast terminals. To keep those West Coast terminals viable and competitive, meaning the ocean carriers still want to call there and bring their ships there because our agriculture exports still go to Korea, Japan, China as the primary markets and those West Coast gateways are the right gateways. Now, as we heard at the annual meeting, a protein exporter from the Midwest said her preference is to truck or rail if she can to the West Coast gateways, but she has to increasingly look at options to go out of the Southeast gateway, Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, because of the slowdowns at the West Coast terminals. So everybody scratches their heads at what slowdowns, what particular slowdowns? Well, you've got the consistent slowdown of the containers on the west coast going up and down the cranes at about 27 to 28 an hour whereas in charleston savannah and wilmington north carolina they're at 42 44 containers an hour same crane same ship same containers that's one but the other one is that cargo has a long memory and i'm sure john can confirm this the logistics people don't forget. And they don't care that something didn't, isn't happening now if it could happen because it did happen nine years ago, as we heard at the meeting. Some of them have stress, labor slowdowns, port slowdowns, and she's talking about something happened nine years which ago, which is informing her decisions today as to which terminals to pick. And it isn't a selection of which terminals on the West Coast, it's to the East Coast. So I think between the truckers and the ILWU, which we heard last week, you know, they love the agriculture exports. It's a made in America product, makes them proud. But, you know, we've got to have that cargo moving. So we have some things that we have to do. Uh, we have to get some teeth in this new demerge and detention guidelines so that it really becomes effective and, and we can remove some of these bottlenecks and reduce incentives to the ocean carriers uh, to allow these bottlenecks to continue. Uh, we need the BCOs on the import side in particular, because I think that's where the leverage is. Uh, you know, we, everybody loves exports when it comes to politicians. They like the farmers, they love exports. But the fact is the ocean carriers, they love the import cargo. Right. So when China isn't producing the import cargo for us, they cancel the sailing. I guarantee you if that import cargo would have all been coming but no exports, they would have sailed anyway, right? Because it's that import cargo that generates. So we have to have some of those big BCOs, particularly on the uh, import side, uh, demanding uh, more efficiency. We need them demanding 
that the carriers uh, cooperate with uh, Gene Soroka and the Port of Los Angeles's efforts for this data collection. It's ridiculous for you truckers and for the exporters and importers that use the truckers to have to make 32 email inquiries to find out when a container is available and where it's available. That's ridiculous. It should be on one portal. And uh, congratulations, or kudos anyway, to, uh, to the Port of Los Angeles for attempting. We would like all the ocean carriers and all the terminals to participate. We know you truckers would absolutely like that. But that's something we've got to get. And as John said, we're in a slow period right now. Wait till we rebound and all this cargo starts flowing right. in. That's going to be a little too late uh, to start addressing these problems. So we have a list of things, and uh, we can talk about them more a little in a little bit. Yeah. So speaking of that, so out of big uh, pandemics, out of hurricanes that hit, out of you know national or large regional major issues that hit, a lot of times there comes opportunities. What do you guys see? are your opportunities for your members coming out of COVID for the next few months and, and moving forward? John, I'll let you go. No, Peter, I'll let you go first this time. Oh. Just put your feet up, John. Uh, look at, uh, we have found that the ports and the terminals aren't, don't have to be as afraid of COVID as we feared earlier on. Port of Houston, they found COVID within 20 hours, they were back in full operation. And I think every port and every terminal uh, in the United States has now taken measure here and the labor on both sides of the country, the LW and ILA have understood how to continue working through and not let this bring us to a screeching halt. So that's, that's an advantage uh, because COVID is not gone nationwide. I think as COVID, and it's uh, not particularly desirable, but it, it's an impact to your question. As COVID starts to penetrate other countries, like Brazil, it's going to knock some of our competitors out of the global market, at least for a while. And we're seeing that with Brazil right now. The other thing is that not only at the terminals, but at the food processors uh, around the country, uh, they have now developed means to address the COVID threat, and they're coming back online. So we're we're kind of past a very significant hurdle uh, that challenged agriculture exports and agriculture processors uh, greatly. So you know that that is something positive. I think also positive uh, is the fact that our agriculture exporters have had to redouble their efforts to open up other markets and get into other markets outside of China. Now, I think that's true for everybody, including people sourcing consumer goods for the United States, right? Everybody's rushing to find uh, some other place other than China to do the business. But for our agriculture exporters, it was, uh, it's been a real kick in the butt to go and open those other markets. Now, there's been much made of the fact that, well, while imports uh, or exports to China are down, you know, 15%, exports to Indonesia are up 148%. But, you know, you're starting from a much smaller base. So we have our eyes open. We need to open up as many of these other markets because even today, altogether, they don't replace China. So um, we are concerned, however, about the renewed tensions between the United States and China. We're very concerned about what Congress and the president are gonna do about the Hong Kong situation and China's uh, imposition of its uh, sovereignty over Hong Kong. These are things that uh, have a lot of us on edge uh, on the export side uh, as well. Okay, John? uh opportunities coming out of something bad for your members yeah i mean i i think the you know the biggest opportunity is going to be a complete reevaluation of the supply chain by a lot of bcos 
um, you know, make sure you've got resiliency built into the supply chain where it might not have been there previously. You know, obviously kind of post 9-11, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on this issue as well. You know, when, if, you know, ports were to shut down, but how do you, uh, you know, improve security within the supply chain? There's been, there was a little bit of that, you know, during SARS looking at, you know, what if a pandemic hits and how do you build resiliency in the supply chain? But I think now that resiliency is going to be top of mind. So, you know, ensuring you have a supply chain that you've fully built risk mitigation factors into that, you know, you don't shut down if something happens like this again, um, you're able to, to keep things flowing. Uh, you know, I think as Peter noted, kind of that, that focus on China and trying to shift away from China uh, is going to continue. You know, it had been happening for the past couple of years with the trade war, but I think it's going to, you know, pick up now. The challenge, though, is that you can't shift everything out of China. It just, it's just not possible. The capacity right. isn't there around the world. You can't, you know, we were in some meetings with some folks that there, there's no new China. Nobody can take up the capacity that China currently has. And the, the, the vertical integration they have within China is going to be difficult to find. Um, you know, throughout the trade war, folks looked to try and go elsewhere and, you know, other countries got full. Uh, they didn't have the capacity. Uh, and it's not something that can be done overnight. It takes time to go and find a vendor that can, you know, meet all of your specifications. They've got the workforce that can make the product, uh, meet some different U.S. regulatory requirements, you know, product safety. Uh, do they have infrastructure in place to handle larger volumes? Can the ports handle larger volumes? Uh, do they meet CSR requirements, security, and all this stuff? So, you know, it's great. It's great talking point saying, hey, let's bring everything home and shift supply chains. But you can't do it. It's just not something you can do overnight. And, uh, you know, so that's I think that's going to be a focus is trying to, you know, put a realistic front on this and trying to figure out how do you realistically put build a supply chain in kind of a post coronavirus, post COVID world where you've got that flexibility, the resiliency built in if something were to happen again. So I think it's looking at the operation from end to end, uh, not just on the sourcing side, but how do you handle things here as well? Uh, I think obviously, you know, as we talked about earlier, that that e-commerce boom is something that a lot of companies are going to be looking at as well. And how do you build more technology into the system uh, to build in some of these efficiencies as well? You know, if you've got a workforce that's to, you know, work from home, you know, how do you have a workforce at a warehouse distribution center work from home? You can't do that. Right. So, you know, if you've got to put social distancing in place, um, how do you do that? So I think there's going to be that technology piece and going to be a big evaluation here. Um, and obviously the biggest challenge we have right now is, you know, all the folks that have been furloughed or let go, the, the high unemployment, um, you know, how do you bring those folks back? And if you don't bring them back, where else do they go? How do you train that workforce again for a new reality, a new uh, path forwards? Peter, can I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, one of our challenges, and it was definitely a challenge for the truckers in Southern California, was at the outset, governors and others we're trying to differentiate between essential mm -hmm. and non-essential business. What they did not know, but they learned, is that in the supply chain, everything's essential. Right. So you have to be able to truck. You have to be able to pull a container out of LA and Long Beach and take it to a distribution center in Riverside. I don't care if it's playhouses, if it's golf clubs, if it's tennis shoes, if it's party dresses, you got to be able to take those to that place in Riverside, have it opened up so that distribution center has to be essential, the trucking of those products has to be essential, so that that container is empty, so that that container can then be hauled on a chassis, hauled to some place where you're going to pick up medical devices, which you're going to take someplace else to some hospitals or medical distribution centers, right? Well, they said that's essential, but they didn't understand everything is essential. So you had in Pennsylvania, you have the governor shut down all the rest areas on the turn Pennsylvania turnpike, because that's un not essential to be in a rest area. Well, where the heck are the truckers going to park overnight and sleep? So finally, he figured that out. I got to say, in Southern California uh, and Gavin Newsom and uh, the mayor Garcetti, they figured that out sooner than others. And in Oakland as well, everything is essential to keep the supply chain moving. Now, a challenge here and a big difference from coronavirus on the exporter uh, in agriculture is for the truckers. The truckers uh, for bringing food and agricultural products. The best markets were always the restaurant markets. They pay the most. 
well, that's not where food's going now. It's not going to restaurants. It's going to distribution centers for Amazon and Costco and so forth, or the e-commerce retailers. That has required a major change in trucking a distribution, in the trucking infrastructure and allocation of drivers and the routes and everything else. One of the benefits of coronavirus is that is instantly pushed us into e-commerce where e-commerce was probably going to get in five years in terms of food and so forth. It's moved us further and we're going to have this e-commerce for many years, as John said, but for food, for agriculture, it's moved us forward much faster than would have otherwise been the case, getting it to grocery stores rather than to restaurants. So um, one of the benefits of this, I guess it's ex accelerated, which is already a trend. Okay. Um, so speaking of COVID again, what, uh, moving forward, what do you see uh, on the retail space, John? How do you see, and I know it's probably not something you can fully answer, but what are you hearing out there on how the new world's going to look? Uh, in California, I know Ross stores and a lot of the, the certain clothing stores are, are reopening. They've reopened mm -hmm. you know, by county last week or this week. Yep. Um, how how is that how is that changing? Sure. So we've we've actually one of the projects we've been working on over the past couple of weeks is our uh, Operation Open Doors uh, project. Uh, you know, as we were looking at the you know, how do we get through this issue and how do we get stores back open and operating again? And there were, you know, a number of issues that we've been working through. The logistics piece of it, how do you get the store back open and running? The liability issues uh, that are there, the workforce issues that are there, and just the, the legal issues. So, uh, you know, I think that that guidance is essential coming out of the, the, the federal government. Um, you know, as kind of Peter noted, the, the one of the challenges that we continue to face is the kind of patchwork of, how things are being opened up again and how states and counties and localities are doing things very differently. You know, who's requiring a face mask, who's not, who's enforcing the mask uh, requirement. Um, you know, for the retailers in general, you know, I think they're trying to make sure that their, their stores are safe for the workers and for the, the shoppers. That is, that is top of mind. I think you've seen uh, a lot of things that will, will certainly change. You'll see, I know a lot of grocery stores now that have been open, have been doing things like uh, one-way aisles uh, to try and make sure you've continued to practice the social, social distancing. Uh, I would encourage everybody who's participating on this call, please make sure you look at the floor as you're walking to see the signs of which way you're supposed to go. Right. Um, I know I've been in many stores where folks just don't pay attention. And there's a reason why, why folks are doing this. And just, you know, it's it, pay attention, please. Um, and, you know, please be kind and courteous to the folks that are working in, in the store. Um, say hi, say thank you, say goodbye. It really means a lot to the workers uh, to hear that. And uh, the workers are just trying to do their job. So, you know, if there's a mask requirement and you go in and they ask you to put a mask on, please put a mask on. It's not just for your benefit, but it's for their benefit as well. So, um, you know, I think that's just, you know, a couple of quick things, but you're going to see changes, you know, I, I know Kohl's, uh, I saw a video of the Kohl's have put together on the changes they're making. They've widened the aisles in the stores. Uh, they changed shopping hours, uh, again, to address some of the social distancing issues, putting up the plexiglass at the checkout, trying to do more contactless checkout. Um, so a lot of this innovation that's happened, you know, uh, very quickly, uh, I think is going to continue, you know, even if we get through this and, you know, if there's a vaccine and, you know, all is good, I think a lot of this is going to stay in place. And a lot of that really is because of the the demand from the consumer to make sure that they're shopping in a, in a safe space. Um, obviously, it's going to be different between, you know, a smaller retailer, mom and pop versus what you do in a, in a larger format store. But, you know, I think everybody's trying to put these new procedures and practices in, in place. Um, and hopefully it'll be, be for the best. It might be a little uh, inconvenienced at first, but I think folks will, will get used to it and I think we'll appreciate that going forwards. Hey, Peter, uh, we've got about six, seven minutes until we open it up. Um, from your take on that, I know that ag stuff is already very highly regulated, FDA being clean, sanitized. What new measures are being taken with your membership on COVID-19? Uh, there have the problem or the challenge for agriculture processing it is typically very labor intensive B, the volumes are massive 
see people are working shoulder to shoulder on these assembly lines, you know, where they're especially on protein uh, assembly lines. Now, over the last few years, long before COVID, the problem for agriculture has been not being able to get the people to work in the fields, in the processing plants. A lot of people want to come up from Mexico and work and political, due to political reasons, and our own labor unions and others, there have been all sorts of limitations on the volume of people that could come here and do the work, whether it's in the orchards in Wenatchee, uh, whether it's in the processing plants even in Indiana, whether it's in the fields in Alabama, you know, the politicians thought, well, if we don't let them come in here and work, our own people will go out there and work. Yeah, not that many people want to work in August and July in the fields of Alabama, in the, you know, picking, picking the strawberries and stuff. Uh, same thing in the Central Valley, uh, near to where you are. I mean, not that many people. Here want today. To be, yeah, they don't want to be on their hands and knees there picking things off the, you know, plants that are six inches off the ground. So that has been a challenge that agriculture has had to meet and was on its way to, to making substantial process, progress. There has been massive mechanization getting into processing to the extent possible uh, over the last few years. So, you know, the machines, you don't worry so much about COVID, but the distribution of them that gets back to your truckers. Where do you get the truckers? Where are the truckers resting? Where are the truckers, especially at these inland points? It's not like they're able to get home every night. Um, you know, those are the, the COVID challenges uh, that, that agriculture faces, uh, in addition to the bigger one of the shift of where the trucks have to move things to and from. Um, you know, we just talk about agriculture, you would think that we have members who are in the nursery business plants. Well, shout out, I guess, for Costco. We just bought two four foot plants with big pots and three 40 pound bags of dirt that just came through e-commerce. You know, they were delivered like everything else right here. I, I'm loving it, but I think it's going to have a permanent impact, right. not only on the retailers, but on the entire distribution pattern. And yeah. I think uh, our <clears throat> politicians have to understand that as well. Uh, they have to make it feasible for truckers to move in all these new and different routes uh, and give them the hours of service that they need to get to places that they frequently did not have to get to previously. Okay, a uh, couple minutes each. I wanna get your guys's, um, uh, your involvement with your membership in Fact Finding 29. Can you disclose or whatever, you know, not necessarily what companies, but are you guys heavily involved with Fact Finding 29 with uh, Rebecca Dye and the new Fact Finding mission with her and, and teams? John, I mean, go I, ahead. Yeah, I mean, I know we've had a couple Just of a members. Couple that have, we wanna yeah, open I, it up for questions. I, I mean, I know we've had a couple of members that have been participating. They were participating in the, in the prior um, uh, innovation teams that, that Rebecca had set up. So, uh, you know, to be honest, it's been a pretty closed process. So we haven't heard a whole lot of what's been happening. They put out the, the release uh, two, 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 three weeks ago with some of the, the high level learnings. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot more work needs, that needs to be done. Um, you know, we certainly hope there's more learnings that come out. And I think, you know, one of the things uh, that, that was mentioned there is that uh, coordination and communication. Uh, you know, they said they need more from the BCOs, but I think it's gotta be, you know, more transparency and more communication throughout the system. You gotta have this end to end. And I think, you know, as Peter noted, the work that Gene is doing in Port of LA and the, uh, you know, the, the program they've got there where you're looking at the, the data where everybody has input and availability and visibility. I think that is that is a critical part of this. Um, again, I come back to you. It's, let me, it's let amazing me stop to have quick, it. If, I, if I can. Let, actually, I'd rather f uh, focus on D&D &D and the new ruling. Sure. Have your membership, I'd rather, I think that's more important to us. Have your membership started working with the interpretive rule? Have they tested it? Uh, not that I've heard yet. I know folks were uh, supportive of the, you know, obviously we were, were you know, a key, uh, one of the key groups pushing this along with HTA, along with AgTC and, and others. You know, we, we started putting the petition out there back in 2016. 
Um, so we're glad to see that FMC actually took this up and and went with it. And I think we got a we got a good rule coming out of it. It's pretty much exactly what we had asked for initially. Um, so I haven't heard yet that folks have put it into use. Um, but I think I'm not. Has it actually been published yet? I think we're still waiting to see it actually published in the Federal Register. Um, but I haven't heard yet that anybody has challenged uh, any D and D yet. Um, you know, my hope is that the carriers have learned from previous experiences that. You know, during a crisis, this is not the time to try and, you know, gouge and uh, create profit centers. So hopefully that is not happening. But I haven't heard any complaints from, from my members with regards to that uh, as of yet. Peter? I'll give you a three points. So first of all, on your supply chain teams, Peter, you're asking the wrong, uh, you're asking the wrong Peter about that because you've been involved in those from the beginning. But in, in terms of the supply chain teams, we started six years ago with Rebecca Dye and pushing these. So you know we have a lot of our members, uh, Allenberg Cotton, uh, International Paper, you are involved, Peter. Robert Loya is very much involved. Brenda Barnes, you know, for a lot of potato exporters. Uh, Robin Knight, uh, Mike Simonen, as I mentioned. Donna Lamb, again, the cotton exporters. Uh, Sean Healy with the schooler. So there's a ton of our people involved, and thank you for being involved. Now, in terms of demersion de detention, one, the question is, how do we get teeth? These are guidelines, and some people thought, uh, John didn't, we didn't, because John was right at the very beginning of it. These are guidelines. It was a major step forward for the FMC to stand up to the ocean carriers and say, no, we're not gonna capitulate to you. We're actually going to do something for the US shipping public. It happens all too rarely with the Federal Maritime Commission, and, brought, and uh, Rebecca Dye pushes through. That's why she's AGTC's person of the year. One she's Ag yeah, she's AGTC's person of the year just because she stood up to the carriers and got it. Demersion detention, we, it needs teeth. We have some draft provisions that some of John's BCOs can hopefully ram into some of their contracts because you'll be the first to have leverage to do it. The FMC needs to self-initiate, and another FMC commissioner has himself said that these guidelines have to have teeth, and he would like the FMC to pursue that. Great, great. Awesome. Thank you. You answered all of it. All right. We're going to open it up for questions. I think Eric's going to take over from here. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, if we go over a couple of minutes, I hope that's okay for everybody. Thank you. Sure. So uh, we got a lot of questions already coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and just say last call already, since so we can get to the ones that are already in. But uh, first off, I think Weston is on the line. Can you with a question? Hey, if you want to play. hey everybody! Long time, long time listener, first time caller. Thanks for having me. Um, I just I want to thank you guys for doing this, and and Peter, I think you've got a future in moderating. So I thank you very much. But my my question is, I've heard you guys. <laughs> I've heard you guys talk about the the new normal a couple times, and I wanted to I wanted to get your insights in Washington D.C. Are they at least acknowledging the fact that once there's a vaccine in place, that this is no different than than influenza, or are they going to look to make wholesale changes permanently moving forward? Because I think that personally, I think it's a little bit of an overreaction, but um, I'd love to hear what you guys are hearing in the Beltway. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll start and I'll give it to you. Um, so we were just going for our daily walk with some friends and we live pretty close to the Capitol. So we were there and they were working last night. It was like 9, 30, 10. The flag was up and the light was on. They were working and they were doing, uh, they were doing more. Uh, but this time it wasn't, for the first time, it wasn't COVID. They were doing some things to punish China for its human rights violation. But other than that, in my view, collectively, Republicans, Democrats, House, Senate, President, they've all lost their minds. They, they are spending money, throwing money at this problem. At unprecedented. We are going to be at $5 trillion when in fact, after the Great Recession, when President Obama came in, there was 800, billion and everybody was pulling their hair out thinking that was going to bankrupt us. We're close to five 
trillion dollars by the time this whole thing gets scored. It's, it's unbelievable. So the question is, are they going to go back to normal? Well, frankly, all bets are off. First of all, this has been totally politicized. Apparently, if you want to get back to work, you're a Republican. But if you want to stay home, be safe, you're a Democrat. I mean, this thing has gotten so politicized. And sorry, but this is a presidential election year. Two things happen in presidential election years. We get stupid legislation, and we're going to have more and more of it on COVID or anything else. And two, trade suffers. You know during election year, they made these candidates come in. Trans-Pacific Partnership was a victim of, of that, of an election year. And uh, I think, uh, hold on to your britches, because we're not going to see anything particularly positive coming out of this Congress or the White House or the candidates, Republican or Democrat, or Senate, where the Senate's in play and the White House is in play during this election year. Yeah, and I, I definitely think, first of all, Weston, congrats. Hopefully you're, you're getting some sleep these days. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a challenge going forwards. You know, I, who knows what that new normal is going to be? I think, as Peter noted, you know, there's going to be a lot of focus. You know, there is a lot of focus on how do we punish China? Uh, for a variety of reasons. How do we shift supply chains? How do we bring things back? How do we nationalize supply chains? Whether it's on, you know, medical PPE or, you know, critical minerals or just U.S. manufacturing as a whole, you've got, you know, a, a wing within the administration that basically wants to shut our doors and just do everything here and not, you know, engage with the rest of the world. Um, so that certainly makes it a challenge. And as Peter noted, in an election year, that makes it even more challenging because now this is all, you know, part of the political process. So, uh, you know, it's it's silly season. Um, do we get back to that silly season with other other things? Unclear. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of focus on uh, the reopening and how do we get that done. And you know, the big unknown is you know if there's a you know backsliding and you see cases on the rise again. You know, what what happens? Do we have a you know the president has said he doesn't want to have a massive shutdown again, but you know if governors in certain states want to do that, you know they're going to do that and it's going to be a challenge. So uh, it's, you know, nobody has good crystal balls to what's going to happen and how legislation is going to work. I think, you know, in presidential, you know, election years, they always, you know, by the time you hit July, uh, you know, Congress basically shuts down and, you know, nothing else really passes, but uh, unclear right now how this is all going to, going to play out. But I think now, you know, our focus really is on kind of What's going to be the impact on trade and supply chains, China and uh, the rest of the world? Um, because you know, as we go and look to do things against China, the rest of the world continues to, to trade with China and trade amongst itself. Uh, so if we're not back in that game, you know, the threats of let's pull out of the WTO. Well, what else do we have to do? What other organizations are out there? So you know, we've got to be very careful on going forwards. And you know, as Peter noted earlier on. You know, politicians love exports, love manufacturing, but if we don't have imports, we don't have an economy. Um, you know, imports help to drive those exports. And if we're not trading with the world, you know, we're going to have, you know, it's going to be even worse than, than where we are right now. So we've got to focus on how do we get ourselves back up and running, back open again, and how do we promote business around the world? It's just like the politicians didn't understand between essential and non-essential. They're saying they like exports, but they don't like imports. They don't understand. We need each other. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, you know, we got a lot of great information from this meeting. Uh, some people are asking uh, about infrastructure-wise, uh, to keep the West Coast ports competitive, what infrastructure are you guys looking at? I know there's been a lot of talk about setting up more transloading facilities, kind of like that. What are your, uh, your memberships talking about in terms of what kind of infrastructure they want to see on the West Coast? I can tell you for the exporters, they want to have less congestion at the ports, but at getting to the ports. Uh, so some people propose we need more highways, more roads. How about taking a third of the trucks off the existing roads and creating additional capacity or infrastructure that way? Um, I'm sorry, that makes sense in a lot of parts of the country, apparently not in California, uh, for, or at least in Sacramento. But increase the truck weights with you would go far, uh, and hours of service and so forth would go far, because that's the biggest problem in California is the truck access to the port terminals. John? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the other part of it too is it's the productivity and efficiency. It's, you know, we always have the congestion problems. How do we work through this? Um, and, you know, as, you know, Peter said, you know, BCOs don't forget, we've got a labor negotiation coming up in a couple of years and folks are starting to pay attention to that. Um, you know, we had a flare up recently over technology related issues. Folks are looking at that. You know, if one of the issues that's going to help us get through all these uh, congestion issues is technology, we can't have factors in place that are trying to stop technology from happening. The other piece too is, you know, let's be honest, you guys have a very uh, aggressive regulatory uh, 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 agencies that want to do more mm -hmm. for clean trucks and clean air. Um, let's pass a fee that we have no idea what the program is going to be. So, you know, folks yeah. are looking at these new fees that keep coming up. I had a you know conversation with one of the AQMD uh, folks the other day, and it's like, why are you passing a fee when you have no idea what the standards is going to be, how the money is going to be collected, how it's going to be doled out? How about you get the, the basics built first and actually work with the truckers and the BCOs to figure this stuff out? So yeah. it's it's this regulatory piece of it too. So it's not just the infrastructure, but it's all the other pieces to this that complicate the lives of the supply chain and the BCOs yeah. as they're making their decisions. Great. Yeah, I agree with that, especially the regulatory aspects. Yeah. Um, we had a question about uh, driver shortages and shortage of experienced truckers, not just truckers, but experienced truckers. Uh, for someone wants to reinvent themselves and start small and bring new drivers to the pool, where do you, where do the where do you guys stand on recommended first steps for those people that want to either retain new new experienced drivers or train up their drivers? Look at there are to get drivers. First of all, that one of the things we keep going back increase the truck weight limits so you don't need as many trucks because you are just going to have a shortage of drivers. But here's the thing: there are also other things we do in this country where you have somebody who we're happy to graduate from high school, put them into the army, send them over to Iraq, and you can drive a $4 million piece of equipment around. But by God, when he comes back to uh, uh, Modesto, God forbid he gets into a commercial truck and drives down a country road. They don't let him until he's had the requisite number of years of experience, until insurance will cover him, until he's 25 years old. At 25 years old, the person may have long gone into something else, construction or whatever else. He hasn't gone into truck driving. We need to reduce those age requirements down so we can capture people who are competent, who want to go into this business, want to go into this trade, be truck drivers. That's number one. There's been legislation. Of course, the Teamsters oppose it and other people oppose it. But that's an answer right there is to dramatically expand the pool of qualified drivers and reduce the average age of truck drivers. I don't know what it is now. I think the average is almost 60 years old or something like that. It's ridiculous. So it's got to be reduced. That's the way to do it. So, Peter, right. you're talking about the Drive, the drive Safe Act? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yep. I, and I think the other piece of this, too, is let's not put silly legislation in place that, you know, complicates the lives. So things like California AB5. Perfect example, and you know, thank you know HTA and CTA for the There's work that you guys have been doing to to fight that. Uh, I think we recently joined an amicus brief with the chamber and RELA in support of that that effort. So you know, things like that that make it more difficult for for drivers, especially those that want to be independent drivers. Um, you know, there's a reason yeah. why they want to be independent. We've had this fight now going on, you know, over a decade. Uh, so it's things like that that you know why make it more complicated when you know you've got these issues. Let's encourage the investment. Let's encourage small business. Let's encourage these these processes to go forward. Thanks, guys. We're getting close to that twelve uh, the twelve o'clock mark, but uh, if you guys are okay with going a little bit over, we'll keep going. Uh, this question this question is for John. Uh, there's you know there's a lot of pent up demand uh, for consumer goods in retail stores. How do you think once we finally reopen, do you think this is going to affect how peak season looks for your members? Uh, I, I think it definitely will. I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, that uh, a lot of retailers are, are looking at that consumer demand and what that's going to be. Um, you know, again, we've got, you know, I forget what the, the employment number is right now, but if folks don't have that discretionary income to go back and, and buy goods, that's going to have an impact. So I think folks are paying very close attention to uh, what the employment numbers are, what that demand is, what the consumer spend is. You know, again, we saw some some uptick last week. 
but I think retailers are going to be very cautious uh, going forward with their ordering. I think right now, again, you know, retailers are trying to figure out, you know, how they get their stores open and operational again. Um, and then, you know, are they going to make it through the next couple of months? So I think that's going to be a, a big part of this. So uh, I think you'll definitely see an impact on uh, on peak. Uh, it, I don't think we're going to see the peak like we've seen over the past couple of years. Um, we certainly hope we'll see a peak, to be honest. Um, but I think we're still trying to to gauge that and see what that's going to be. Um, you know, hopefully in the next month we'll have a better feel for uh, what we're looking at for the rest of the year. I think, you know, as we looked at both from uh, Global Port Tracker as well as our own, uh, you know, analysis, I think we're hopefully looking at, a, you know, hopefully a bit of a stronger uh, third and fourth quarter. But uh, I think it's too early to tell. Thank you, John. And now now one for directed at Peter. Uh, up to what extent the need for produce or agricultural products from non-traditional countries will be supported in an expedited process? And has there been any announcement in the area uh, beyond the FTA in place? So I think they're asking, um, you know, the if, if there's any uh, non-traditional markets that you're exporting to or importing from that uh, we need to be looking at, and if there's been any announcement to kind of bolster that that uh, that trade. Look at this. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, people are all looking on the import side. That gets all the visibility. You know, look at different places to source other in China. But that's also been the situation for the exporters of processed food. We do know that China has the desire to be much more self-sufficient in agriculture. So we okay. know, you know, there's ultimately going to be some reduction in demand there. So we've got to find these other places, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, India, even Bangladesh. I mean, we're looking at, agriculture's looking at all those places it's but again their cumulative demand even if they buy everything from us it's not going to replace what china does now so we're, yeah we're very sensitive uh very sensitive to that thank you yeah we've been i've been hearing a lot of uh china plus one strategies or people keep floating around that idea that we're doing china plus one so either sourcing or exporting to China plus Vietnam or plus Indonesia or maybe Philippines. So that's, you know, I think that's a trend that everyone's looking at. Um, I think you're looking at a China plus plus, to be honest. Uh, China plus plus? Yeah. That's good too. You know, spread out the risk a little bit. Um, we got a, a comment about trucking turn times. Let me see if I can condense this down real quick. Uh, you know, People are asking for more visibility on trucking turn times. Uh, you know, there's some kind of a, a disconnect between what is published as the turn time and what's actually happening on the on the ground on the road outside of the ports. Are are, are your members looking at turn times as a problem, or what insight can you offer in, in terms of turn times for our, our motor carriers, or how can they engage with your your members better to turn times? Yeah, this, is a, this is an ongoing challenge, particularly for HTA members and everybody shipping through the West Coast gateways. Uh, as Gene says, Gene likes to say, you know, they get a turn time of 87 minutes and they want to throw a parade. You know, when we talked to Savannah and Charleston, I think we mentioned some 87 minutes and some of the turn times. That's the wait at the gate. They can't believe it. They think we're padding the numbers. They don't have same with the challenge. Now, you asked earlier about infrastructure, and this gets right to the turn times. It's a challenge, has to be dealt with. In Oakland, it was dealt with. Two relatively small terminals are now one much larger terminal there. Okay. And America went out. And now, all of a sudden, there was a lot more room to work. When you look at the southeast of the United States, or the Gulf as well, uh, Norfolk and South, they have a lot of real estate and they have a lot of room for expansion. And the challenge in Southern California is that you have all these terminals built for 3,000, 5,000 TEU ships that are supposed to handle 20,000 TEU ships now. And they have all the accesses built for the volumes that previously they can manage with 2,000 containers in and out. Now they can't. Somehow, those terminals 
they need to be combined in some way. They're doing that in Seattle Tacoma now with the Northwest Seaport Alliance, which is helping a lot of the truckers there. But when there was a need to store empty containers recently, desperation to find 12 empty acres somewhere in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. But you go to other parts of the country, oh, we got 300 acres over here for you. I mean, the problem, that's an infrastructure challenge that directly impacts exports, imports, and the truckers somehow got to make these terminals bigger, knowing you don't have any excess real estate in LA and Long Beach to add on. So there's yeah. got to be consolidation. That's critical. John, do you, uh, are your members uh, looking at the same kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, turn time certainly is, is, is an issue. And I think, you know, first and foremost, let's have a common definition of what a turn time is. Um, you know, turn yeah. time is from the time that the trucker gets in line to the time the trucker gets out. That's a turn time. It's not pedestal to pedestal. It's when they first get in line and get through the system and get out. So that certainly is an you know, indication of the efficiency, productivity, or congestion at the point. So it's certainly something that you know our members are, are looking at, and they I think they're relying on the truckers to tell them what those issues are and how long they're waiting. And you know the last thing you want is to be you know, waiting in that line, get to the front of the get to your appointment, and then be told, oh, the container is you know in a closed off section. So yeah. You know, those are the issues that we continue to face. So, you know, turn time certainly is an issue, but it's, you know, one of the, one of many, uh, you know, things yeah. that, you know, BCOs are looking at uh, for the, the system. So we're, we're already uh, six minutes over, so I'll just leave it on a, a last question. Uh, for both of you guys, uh, you know, the HCA wants to be a good partner and, uh, you know, everyone wants to be a good partner. It takes all of us working together. So what things are you looking, like the motor, that the motor carrier can do to help you guys out, what can the HTA and our motor carrier community help help you guys and your customers just kind of make a high functioning, high performing supply chain? You know, I think it, it's keep that communication going. Make sure you're talking to to your beast to the BCO partner uh, and letting them know what the issues are. Be forward thinking. Um, try and find ways to work and develop new processes and new systems uh, that can help alleviate any of the issues. I mean, obviously you guys are, you know, frontline and can, can see what some of these, some of those issues are. And, you know, you guys might have some solutions that people might not be thinking about. So I think, you know, again, be that good partner, be uh, proactive. Uh, don't wait for the, the BCO to kind of tell you a certain thing. If you've got an idea on how to do something better, let the BCO know. There might be something they haven't thought of previously. So I think, uh, right now, BCOs are looking for partners that are, you know, willing to really work through some of the issues and try and figure out how do we do things better. Uh, you know, I think again, the this whole issue has highlighted the importance of supply chain from end to end. So trying to work with your partners across the board to improve the system is going to be extremely important going forwards. Okay, here's, Thanks, uh, here's something uh, specific and very timely right now. We need it. Uh, we know that the congestion that's happening at ports around the country, but say, let's just focus on the West Coast, is what leads to these demurrage and detention charges, right? Uh, cargo gets in, early return date, all these issues are a result of congestion. If we can eliminate the congestion, we do a lot better. But the problem is right now that ocean carriers have no incentive to reduce the congestion because the demurrage and detention charges $150 to $325 per container per day are quite profitable. It's a lot of revenue to the ocean carriers. So eliminating that revenue stream is not necessarily the first priority. So if you eliminate the congestion, you eliminate that revenue stream. As long as that congestion lasts, you, those carriers are going to have that revenue stream. We've heard from one international ocean carrier, a big one, that in their financial projections for this year, they're figuring 20 to 23 percent of their freight revenue will come from ancillary charges, that's your demerit charges. That's an indication that they're expecting and profiting by the congestion. Yeah. The, the solution to that, in my view, is to remove the financial incentive that the carriers enjoy from the current congestion. I think that the provisions that we have drafted in AgTC for BCOs who have the leverage, if they have, 
to put into their contracts with ocean carriers, which removes their ability to charge for some of this detention and demerits, will go far in helping them understand less congestion is better for their business. But it's going to have to be, these are very tough provisions. We're happy to share them. We share them with our ITC members. Uh, we're happy to share them with others. We would love the importer BCOs, John's, because they have, they're the, that's the champion cargo for the carriers, to stick that to the carriers and say, you got to take some of these provisions when they're negotiating with service contracts. Some of our larger AgTC exporters, the biggest volume ones, the top 15 exporters in the United States, they're putting some of those provisions in their contracts. And that way, we can start removing the incentive that the carriers have to maintain the current congestion. Great. Yeah, I think that's a, I didn't think that's a good idea. Um, so we, we've, we've hit over 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I'm going to call it a close. Uh, I think we got to everyone's questions, but if you had more questions for our panelists, go ahead and email them to me and I'll pass them along and get you some answers. Uh, with that, I want to tell you guys, thank you very much. This has been a great session, you know, a lot of great information. My note page has gotten to be like three pages long already. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come speak to us. And then I also appreciate the audience for uh, sticking with us a little bit over over time. Uh, you know, having everybody together and the, have these conversations really benefits it for everybody. You know, if we can all, if motor carrier BCO can work together, you know, we've been probably the better partners in a lot of the discussion on detention to marriage and stuff like that. Uh, you know, getting some of these provisions put in would help out everybody. And uh, I'll let Peter do a, a final comment. I just want yeah, to say, I just want to say, I'd love to do this again uh, in the future. I think this was amazing. <laughs> We'd love Thank to you. do it when you're resting. Yeah, we really appreciate this. This goes a long way. Thank you very much. And we hope you guys are safe. Have a great weekend. Hopefully you get some sleep too, John, yeah. with your babies. <laughs> uh, so thank you guys very much. That's all. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, guys. Take care. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.